Well, one thing, I love to walk in a room where there's a little buzz. You guys seem like you like hanging out together, so we're already way ahead of the game there. And I see a few people I know, you never know who's gonna show up at stuff. Our dean just walked in. You got some superstar professors here, here, and here, and probably others I have not met yet. But it's fun to be here. I appreciate the, the invitation, and we'll spend an hour together and see if we get something done. Sound like a, sound like a plan? I'm an associate professor here, year five here at uh, K-State. Spent a few years at Iowa State prior, PhD, University of Houston. Long, long time ago, I was an undergrad here. It's kind of fun coming home and kind of weird and all that, but I really love being here. Okay, this is stuff you've probably seen, scholarship of learning sort of stuff. That's not really what the presentation's about today. We're just gonna kind of set a little groundwork, but this all came into play mid 80s when I was about you guys' age probably, and it's developed dramatically from there. But the basic idea is there's this iterative process, this cycle of experiential learning where you actually do something. You try it out, and then you have a time, you have an opportunity to go back and say, okay, this worked, that didn't work, kind of review it, kind of reflect on it, and hopefully some learning comes there. Okay, I can't do this, I probably should do this, maybe I'm gonna try that, the experimental part, and then you do it again. So the other day, my daughter's boyfriend came over and said, I need to change the alternator in my car. I don't do stuff like that, to be quite honest but I did have a warm garage and it was cold out. So we watched a YouTube video and we learned a little bit, but the experiential part, we really learned because we got in the garage and we got the lights out and we changed out as alternator. That's the basic idea, you try it. It's way better to try to ride a bike and figure it out than somebody to kind of tell you how it works and count that as learning. Sort of makes sense. And the general idea and what they found over time is there's benefits of this approach. At age recall, at age retention, you can build skills this way. Might need to click on the screen or something there, maybe. We're doing great. We're to slide two already. It's all good. There we go. And you can develop some skills. Okay, so that's sort of the premise, sort of the starting point. Um, a lot of theory here, a lot of things to talk about here, but not really the focus of what we're trying to do today. Okay, we walk in the classroom and at some level, most of us are trying to do approximately this. There's some things by the end of the semester we want them to understand, some things we want them to be able to do, and occasionally we have a student that shows up with the same goals that we have, right? They really do want to understand and they do really want to learn. And sometimes, and when that happens, it's a little bit easier, right? Sometimes we have it where they say, you know what, I'm cranking out the credit hours and if I can help my GPA a little bit, that's nice too. We can sort of work with that. We've sort of figured that out because if we can incentivize understanding and we can incentivize skill development for grading to some extent, right? As long as we're accurately assessing what it is we're trying to get across. So that sort of works and we have ways to sort of boost that up. We've all figured this out. What are some behaviors in students that help them do that? Well, it's nice if they show up. We feel like we can do a better job if we see them occasionally. And if we have a particular activity, whether in class or not, sometimes we can incentivize that, throw some points, whatever it might be, just to make sure they're participating in the things that are gonna help them succeed in the course. So we're all kind of doing this and we're all doing it because it sort of works. It's good to see you. You got it. This is awesome. Your picture is coming. Oh, oh Curry. <laughs> If I would have known, I would have actually got approval to show it. Now I'm caught, right? Here's the challenge that I have discovered here. First of all, I want you to guys to share an assumption with me as if it's truth because there's a lot of truth behind it. Experiential learning as opposed to not using experiential learning, there's some benefits. We've, it's, it's been pretty well documented, things like recall, things like retention, things like skill development. So that's kind of our starting point. We're kind of accepting this as a group today to carry on, okay? But here's the trick. I found that direct assessment of experiential learning is challenging for a few reasons. One is it's the cycle. So imagine you're learning to ride a bike and I'm grading you along the path, okay? You get out there, you got your foot down, you got the pedal right, you're holding these things, you take a few pedals, you fall down. If that's an assignment, the student gets an F for bike riding. But it's part of the process to learning to ride the bike. 
And there's literature and there's scholarship that will show you there's this idea of mastery. You're meeting thresholds. Okay, they know how to get on the bike. Okay, now nah, they've taken a few pedals. That sort of works, but generally speaking, what we want to do is we want the whole process from an experiential learning standpoint. And so as we grade that, we could say, okay, I'm going to incentivize this by grading them on participating in the process. And I've done a little bit of that, and it sort of works, but here's what I figured out. If they're not buying in and they really don't, I have not properly motivated probably why this is important, sometimes they're just kind of going through the motions. And what you really want to make happen is, I have found, they got to care somehow. And what they got to care about is the outcome. And if you can do that, then they're going to be engaged and then they're going to experience it. So that's primarily what we're going to talk about today. Okay, now I'm just going to confess this right up front. I would love to give you a roadmap, a template to make this work in your class. I'm not there yet. I'm going to give you an example of how this has been applied. And the reason it's tough is because context really matters. Now, from a scholarship of teaching standpoint, this is kind of where I'm at. It's a work in progress. It's evolving. It's changing every semester. I feel like I've got to the point where I'm like a consultant that goes in a company as, a, as an academic, but occasionally consult, and they say, here's our particular problem in our particular context. Can you solve this for me? And we have people in academia that do that. Some of them make a nice, it's a nice part of what they do as part of their profession. That's different than academic research where we're always looking for generalizability. We're trying to go in and say, here's some general truths that can be applied in hopefully a broad range of contexts. I know there's some truths there. If you want to see a theory of how this works, I'm not there. So I'm throwing out a work in progress. So I'll get that out right, right now. Here's what I think we can do before we're done. My hope is I can spur your, cre your creativity and my guess is, through a little conversation as we go, I'm almost certain you'll spur mine. It happens every time I talk about this. And I also hope, at some point down the line, I get an email from one of you that says, hey, I actually did this in class. It's sort of related to what we talked about that day. And that would be like gold standard for me if we can just get to something like that. Okay? That's kind of our goal as we, as we work through here. Okay. I thought long and hard about how I could do this. And for me to really under, help you to understand the importance of the experiences I'm trying to generate in the classroom, I got to give you a little taste of sort of the structure of what we're studying for it to make sense. Is that okay? Indulge me for a couple minutes. I'll walk you through. Um, if you're at Spotlight, I sorted to this little piece. It's kind of thing. So here, I teach a sports marketing class. Got 198 students this semester. And this is a foundation, the framework of everything we study. You've got a product. It's a sports organization at some point. It actually is broader than that, but we'll keep the story simple for now. It's the Dallas Cowboys. They start doing something compelling, and people start paying attention to it. It's interesting. They've got some fans. As soon as that happens, other things start to come into play. The sponsors say, you know what? I'm going to start paying attention to the Cowboys. I'm going to get my signage up in their stadium and all those things. You know why? They want the attention from the fans. They're trying to borrow a little bit of that influence. Hey, I'm Coca-Cola. I'm tapped in with the Cowboys. You love the Cowboys. You got to love Coca-Cola a little bit. Media does the same thing. Ah, they have some fans. Let's start covering the Cowboys because if we cover the Cowboys, they're going to start reading our websites and our magazines and our newspapers. I think there's still a few of those around and all those kind of things. They even start working together. You watch the broadcast. They're talking about the Houston Texans, and they don't say Texas are playing in Texas Stadium. They say they're playing in NRG Stadium. It's all branded. all works together. That's the platform we're talking about here. That's how this whole thing works. Okay. This is important. So we got this system. I'm going to back up here. We got this system, and this whole system is built up, and there's inherent value in this system. There's people that care about various things, and there's especially people that care about the fans, the team, the, the team, the sponsors, and the media. So there's inherent value here, but we got to create inventory to make that happen. We get it. The inventory of a team consists of a couple things. Number one, 
all the ability to market your product through our team, signage, broadcast rights, every, every, naming rights, everything. The other thing is there's inventory related to the fans, tickets, luxury suites, programs, merchandise, everything. So it's all built on that. So what do I want them to experience? I want them ultimately, when they are in a job, and say it's in a sports organization, and they're thinking about their inventory, and they're going to do a couple things. There's a creative component, and there's an appropriation component. So value creation is, of this value system, how do I create inventory that I can sell to fans and sponsors? And number two is, how do I appropriate that? Do I realize the value? In other words, how do I sell it? But the real thing I want to experience is by the time the semester is over, I want to act, them to actually feel like, be able to feel what it feels like to do this stuff in the role of the team. What's it feel like if you're in the role of a fan? And what's it feel like if you're in the role of a sponsor? Because ultimately, if you're in a team and you're doing this and you know how the fans and the sponsors are going to feel and what they're going to experience when you do something, you're way ahead of the game. So that's the goal. We, we're good now? That's my little preface. Now we can actually do something. You guys ready? At one point, this was the revelation that really helped me. Our class is a lot like the team, or it could be. I actually have inventory. I actually have things my students slash fans want, and I actually have things in here that my students acting as sponsors want. And this took me a while to figure this out. I was about three semesters in on this thing before I realized we're going to stop talking about studying a sports organization and we're going to start being a sports organization and doing all those things within it. Okay, I'm going to give you a little, a little piece of this so we can kind of tell a coherent story here. There's, it's broader than this and everything that goes on in the class is involved in this. But the idea here is, um, I'm just going to pull out a little piece. So here's where we start. We have this Business of Sports and Entertainment Speaker Series, eight to 10 speakers. These are execs from sports organizations or firms that market through sports. They come in the classroom. And the big part of what we do in the class, a lot of external benefits to having all these people in. I'm trying to figure out, when we have these speakers in, what do I want my students to be doing on the day they come in? What are the things that would really matter? And the big thing I want to make sure we're doing is when they come in, I want our speakers to say when they leave, I have never been in a classroom like that. I have never met students like that. So what do the students need to do to make that impression? Number one, they need to be there, right? Number two, when they're there, they need to be engaged. And number three, and you'll see how this works in a second, they need to be prepared for this speaker. So that's what I need. That's what I want them to do. And anytime I think about things I want them to do, it has to meet one of two criteria. It has to either help them succeed in the class or it has to make the class better. I want my students engaged in activities that do one of those two things. Okay, that's the first I'm putting together a couple pieces and where we're heading is the experience, but we gotta, we gotta get there first. This is the first little piece. Here's the second little piece. This is what I want them to do. What do they want that I can actually provide? And what I've learned when the Royals come in or the Chiefs come in or the Oklahoma City Thunder or Muscle Milk or Nike or whoever, they want a couple things. Number one is, they want to get down to a one-to-one -one conversation for a whole bunch of reasons. I want to pick their brain and figure out how this works. I would sure like to work for them. So access, hugely valuable to many of the students in the class. Number two is, these are sports organizations. They're marketing why they're here, which I love because we can talk about that. Did you see how they did this? Half of the business school students are going to end up in KC. The Chiefs, the Royals, Sporting KC, they enjoy getting in front of our students. Mutually beneficial when they come to campus. And so they'll bring stuff, some cool stuff sometimes. They'll bring a jersey. They'll bring a sign ball. They'll bring whatever. Students love that kind of stuff. 
So I know I have inventory through the guest speaker program of things they desire. Okay, so we got things they, I want them to do, and we got things they want. Now my job is to connect those two things together. So how do I do that? And the way I do that is I incentivize those behaviors I want. Now this can be done a lot of ways. It can be done within your point system, I'm sure. This is not particularly new in a, in a foundational sense, but the way we've done it, because this is a current topic within sports organizations and beyond, is we created a virtual currency. We call it the SMART. You guys see how clever I am. I took the S from the sports and the Mark from the marketing. They like the name. So it's called the SMART. And the way we use SMART is when they do the things that I want them to do to either help them succeed in the course or help the course, they get incentivized and they earn this virtual currency. So in the example I gave you, I want them to be there. They can earn SMART for being there. I want them to be engaged. So as a class, they can all get a little smart if they're there early. When the guest speaker walks in, I want them to feel like something's going on. If there's a buzz in the room, I incentivize that. Our first day of class, we literally practiced this. We said, okay, I'm gonna be the guest speaker. I went up to the back. You guys are in here waiting for them to walk in. When I walk in, there ought to be a little noise. You ought to be laughing, have a little bit of fun, getting up, walking around. We practiced it. They did. It was awesome. We walk in. They're ready. I go, wow, this room, they're ready to go. In all honesty, like you guys, I walked in today. Nice buzz. That's exactly what we're talking about there. The third part and the thing that really impresses um, the guests is when it comes Q&A time, they are ready with relevant questions. So we post content on Canvas about the speakers, the key problems they're facing in their industry. They're incentivized to engage in that content and come to class with each one, at least one question. And the rule is we have to run out of time before we run out of questions. There cannot be a, anybody have any more questions? Never, we have to cut it off. If we put those three things together, the speakers routinely tell me, your class was amazing today. Okay. I think we sort of could all agree that would be good, right? But the key to this thing is I have to demonstrate to them that this virtual currency actually has a value to them. Haven't done that yet, right? This is just all a little dream right now. So first day of class, they come in and I say, by the way, this is right at the end, you all have a balance of 50 SMART, our class virtual currency. They have no idea what it is. You can earn them invest them, and spend them on things you want. It has value. Let me show you. Here's a $10 Medina's gift card. Let's have an auction. And they all just kind of sit and look for the first person to make a bid, and somebody finally does. And then somebody that really likes coffee raises the bid. And then a few people, you get in a competition, an auction, they start sort of battling it out, and somebody buys it. So this semester, 40 smart. Somebody spent about all they had. And I said, okay, you guys just valued our virtual currency for us. You just told me that there's 200 of you, you all have 50 smart, there's 10,000 units outstanding, and you just told me that $10 divided by 40 smarts equals 25 cents per smart times 10,000. We just created out of thin air a virtual currency with a value of at least $2,500. In essence, because I love you guys so much, I just handed each of you $12.50 when you walked in the classroom. So now we've demonstrated that they value it. Even if they don't totally get it yet, we can show you must value it. And everybody values it more than the person that bought it or they would have outbid it. So now we have, we're incentivizing for what I want them to do with something I know they now value. And so we can move on to the next piece here. This is, now we're finally, 20 minutes in, we finally got to the experience itself. These are the things I want them to experience. So the first thing, they get to experience from the standpoint of a fan. What happens when a team allows access to some of its fans? 
So the royals came, two execs, always take them out to lunch after the class, and ask the class, if you really want to know the royals, we're having an auction for two seats at lunch, in this case, three. Three seats at lunch, highest three bidders win, random draw to break ties. Some people will save their smart all semester waiting for their team to get there, the one they really want to connect with. So what happens here is a few good things happen. Number one is the most motivated students are the ones that get in front of our partners. They're prepared, they're ready, they're there for a reason. So I know the impression the students make just by the capitalist system is going to be a good one. They're the ones that want it the most. Things like networking comms. Um, Ex they get to tap into their expertise. So far this semester, we've had three lunches and they've, there have been five internship offers. Five people are working internships remote this semester with people at lunch. So now they really get it. Being able to get that opportunity really matters to them. But this is the best part. This is the experience part. For them, as fans of a team, keep mapping it back to that. They understand what it feels like to earn something. It could just be your money in your pocket and spend it on something you want for premium access that many other fans aren't getting. Just as importantly, we have students in the class that might have liked to go to lunch, maybe not, but they realize they're not gonna go, not everyone can go, well, how did that make them feel? So we talk about it in class. This is a reflection part. So this is what happens when a team does this. Some people can go down in the tunnel and watch K-State's team come out on the field. Not everybody, all 50,000 people can't go inside and watch them right before they come out, but some people can. Well, there's 10, 20 people down there doing that. They're having an incredible time. What an opportunity. There's 51,000 minus 20 that didn't get to do it, but they see those people down on the field and say, wow, I sure wish I could get down on the field. So everything you do as a team for some people is a huge plus. For some other people, they're probably indifferent. For some others, wow, I sure wish I could get that opportunity. It doesn't feel so great. They bring merchandise occasionally. Muscle Milk brought a signed Steph Curry ball. That's actually my TA this semester. He was there. He happened to be the wealthiest person in the class. He got the ball. This is a great example of things that go on inside a sporting arena. You have some sort of giveaway. They bring a pizza up to some fans, or they drop something from a little blimp thing in the stadium and somebody falls down. It happens all the time. Great for the person that gets it, Totally a bummer for people two seats away that felt like they almost got it. And kind of at some level, wow, I wish that was me for the other people all around the arena. So if you're a team and you're going to do giveaways in your arena, you got to realize something. You're going to make somebody really happy. A whole bunch of people probably won't care one way or the other. And you're going to have some people that are going to have some level of disappointment if there wasn't them. And the students have actually felt what those different roles have felt like. So when they're the ones making the decision, they can anticipate how the people in the crowd are gonna feel. That's the general idea. We talk about this stuff forever. Okay, naming rights. My single favorite thing we've done because of just how funny it was in class. Naming rights are huge and I hadn't really thought of how to make this whole thing work. And 99% of these ideas get hashed out at the dinner table with my wife and my daughters. And now both of my daughters have graduated and I've lost my relevant age sounding board. I'm probably in desperate straits here. But I run out ideas, they kill a huge majority of them and I appreciate they do, I'm sure they're not good. But this one, I said, this will work. And my youngest daughter, who was still a student said, she goes, that actually will work. And my wife said, you're crazy, who would do that? And so this is about two weeks ago, said, you know what, you guys naming rights, we talked about naming rights, sponsors buy to have their name on the stadium, on, on the walls, everything, everything's named. There are a lot of things in our business school are named. And there's a lot of motivations for doing that. You wanna show you're partnering with an organization, that you're part of it. There's a status, there's recognition. People buy naming rights for all sorts of different reasons. I said, you know what, I bet you somebody would love to have the first homework assignment named after them. 
So we had an auction. And you know, as a professor, there's, there's a couple ways. Usually we're like a good attorney. We walk in the room and we never do anything we know that's not gonna work. We never ask a question we don't already know the answer for. But you know how occasionally you kinda wanna try something and you get in there, you know you're on the tightrope, you know you might get zero. You're just kind of hanging out there just for the fun of it and see what happens. That was this day. I had no idea. There was a bidding war. It was hilarious. So we got down to about five and they happened. No, there was one female. One, four guys. Four guys are really in it. One female was in it for a while. She bailed. Um, here's where we ended up. We got the Justin McCulloch Family Homework One assignment in our class. Everywhere, it's everywhere. That's the, that little yellow box, that's on my introductory slide every day. Every time they walk in, him and about two or three friends he sets with, they all laugh, pat him on the back, he's just loving it. It's in the grade book. You go in the grade book, it doesn't say homework one, it says Justin McCulloch family homework one. I'm up in front of the class, I said, don't forget, it's due Thursday, make sure you download and get to work on the Justin McCulloch homework one. Yesterday, I sold exam one naming rights for even more. A guy spent all his money on it, everything he had. Harrison Carney. I even upped it. I said, Harrison, if you want your picture on the exam, send me a high resolution headshot. It'll be on there. So here's what I cannot wait to do. This is going to happen after the first exam. We're going to have a discussion about, from a sponsorship perspective, Justin, how did it feel? Everybody in the class knows you. They think you got a good sense of humor. They know what you look like. They know where you're set. They know who your friends are. For some of us, that's the best thing in the world. For some of that, that's a total nightmare. And we're also going to talk about, for those of you that got outbid, how did you feel that it's Justin's name when it was almost yours? We're going to have a whole bunch of people that could care less. But here's kind of, in all honesty, what I hope we have, and I bet we do. And I'm going to kind of try to ferret this out some way. We're going to have some students in the class that find this annoying. There's a whole bunch of reasons I can think of. One would be it's just unnecessary verbiage. I'm looking for homework on Canvas. I would assume I could look for an H. No, I got to look for some random name you've attached there, make it confusing. But I think, I think I'm going to have some students that look, I'm a college student. I'm paying money for these classes. And you're just screwing around, naming name and assignments and stuff, but this actually is a key issue in the content of the course. I want them to experience, when I go in and I'm listening to my favorite team on the radio, and every time, instead of staying, here's K-State playing in the Independence Bowl, they're saying, here's K-State playing in the Poolin' Weed Eater Independence Bowl, and they say it 500 times during the telecast. At some point, for some people, that can get pretty annoying. I want my students to know, you can sell all this inventory all day long. Name stuff, name everything, pictures, everything, everything's branded. Some people, some of your fans are going to say, gosh, this is a little much. They need to know that. They need to realize that it's not just about can I sell it, it's kind of should I sell it, and how should I do it. So the experience Really try to feel it as a fan. Really try to feel it as a, as a sponsor. Okay, this was harder. I want them to feel it as the team too. And here's how we got to this. And we started this last semester and it really worked well. Okay, you guys get how this works now. We do an in-class activity and say, pick your favorite team, get in a group, create a list of inventory they currently are not selling to your knowledge. Go on, see what they got. What could they be doing? Because I know organizations, Oklahoma City Thunder told us, we have a revenue meeting. Everybody's there. We sit down and talk about what inventory do we have that we're, we're not selling right now. Teams are absolutely doing this. And it's not just a sports thing. Companies are doing this. What do we have that we can sell? Services, products. Coca-Cola sells a lot of soft drinks. You know what else they sell a lot of? T-shirts and sweatshirts with their brand on it. That's just creating inventory based on the value that you've created within your organization. And so here is, you guys know what we're doing. Let's practice this for your team. Okay, now me and you are the class. 
let's create inventory that you guys want. And this is when the fun started. They want me to wear stuff, hats with their fraternity on. I mean, they want to promote everything. Some ideas that I tried to ignore, didn't even comment on, but a lot of great stuff, super creative. This one was great. Oh, I got to go back one. I got to tell you a story about it first. Last year, and I've told about this in class, the Los Angeles Dodgers created a virtual bobblehead. Everybody that came to the game didn't get a bobblehead. They got an access code. And it's all blockchain, like a Bitcoin. You really do own it. But you just go online and watch your bobblehead bobble. That's it. It's just digital. They paid a programmer a little bit of money, scale it up to $5 billion. It doesn't cost them another penny. And I looked last year. Right after it happened, you buy one on eBay for 18 bucks. You could buy that, basically start transferring that uh, blockchain item like a Bitcoin. Cheapest one I could find is 72 bucks. It's unique. So I said, Chiefs are pretty good. How about we sell this? You will be known in our class as the greatest Chiefs fan in our class. Bidding war, richest guy in the class bought it. Adam Berg is now our biggest Chiefs fan. We splashed it on our social media. These have appeared on my slides in the last few days, including my fake quote from Coach Andy Reid. Every time it comes up, I look at him. He's smiling. His friends are laughing. Absolutely loves it. So digital assets have value. Anybody video game player out there? Not too many. I'll let you know this. A game called CSGO. You can buy the cost to buy what they call a skin. Decoration for your rifle goes, the top, the most popular ones go for three times as much as the actual rifle sells for in the real world. People value this. It's part of their status. It's part of their, um, how they, uh, it's just like, I hope I got a decent jacket on. I think it's fairly nice. It's part of how I want to portray myself. People have an online persona. It's part of how they want to portray themselves. So now our students are thinking about, when I get in my organization, what, what do we have to sell? They're thinking about it in whole new creative ways. And it's really fun, and they're enjoying it. There you go. I promised you. This is one of my favorite ideas they had. Can we have a luxury box in our classroom? Sure. So we roped off some seats. One of my TAs met you guys when you came in, greeted you, let you through the ropes, you sat down, we had a little goodie bag, leftover things from the teams, brought you a little food and drink, I think, right? A little something, a little popcorn and stuff like that. I greeted them the very first thing in class and a welcome to you guys was on the first slide of the class. And you guys look like you were having a good time, three guys, pretty good friends there. And everybody else was sort of looking at them, just like we all do at the games and say, wow, that doesn't look bad. I should have paid for that seed or I wish I could afford that seat. As a team, you got to think about that. And I know in the Astros game, there's a sec two sections right behind the home plate where they have service at your chair, concessions and everything. Right across the aisle, three feet away, where my family and I said a few times, we didn't. We got to go stand for two innings in line at the concession stand and watch them five feet away get served the whole game. Awesome for them. Maybe it's aspirational for me at some level kind of a bummer in all honesty. And so understand, everything's got a plus for somebody, probably not a plus for others. Okay, last thing I'm going to show you. This sports betting thing is transformational for sports. States are starting to add it. It's changing the sports product. It's going to change fandom. I'm working on a paper with a colleague upstairs, another one at Xavier. We're looking at this very thing. How is this going to change fandom, loyalty to teams? Because if you're betting on your team and your team doesn't cover and you lose your money, part of your, part of your response is going to be towards your team. Come on, you let me down. So I think it's going to have some fundamental changes. So they've got this smart. Oh, the other thing is I want to teach them uh, expected value and decision-making under an uncertainty. They don't know that yet. We haven't done it yet but this is a perfect way to teach the analysis that they need. And so they have to analyze these wagers. But I said, I put out a few wagers, said, you can actually wager your smart if you want to. You have to calculate expected value and everything. But now they are having an experience that fans of these teams are gonna have. 
It's a bummer if you lose, and it's kind of cool if you win. And all these teams, fans, many of them are going to be involved in this, and the teams need to understand what their fans are experiencing and how that's going to change things for them. Make sense? There's a lot of payoffs to all of this stuff. It's pretty fun. We have a good time in class. It definitely creates an atmosphere that I think is really positive for learning. Um, some students come to class and just tell me, I go, hey, how you doing? Good. He goes, it's raining. I really wasn't going to come, but kind of wanted to see what you're going to do today. So that's a good thing, right? Um, students are engaged. They're definitely in there. Um, we set little things up. This little nothing, do a little something on the slide that gives them some indication something's coming where they can spend their smart, keep some, keep some um, tapped in for sure. The corporate partners come and say, hey, I have some giveaways. How should we go about that? Like first person to answer a question and go, in all honesty, we auction this thing off. They're going to go crazy for it. And they love it. Next time they bring more stuff. I mean, it's really fun and it really gets a cool connection between the teams and the students in the class. We have prospective students. I'm not sure how they're figuring this out because we're not doing much externally really, but they'll come in and I met them over the summer and they said, hey, I heard you, and we were down there talking to students in the atrium and they said, hey, we heard from somebody from our high school about this class and it's just good. I mean, it's fun to talk about. It's something sort of different. So the students are experiencing stuff. They're really doing stuff from a, a teaching scholarship perspective, I'm not actually a practicing teaching scholar, I guess, yet, because I'm busy enough on my research and my substantive area, but I'm trying to take that approach. We're measuring some stuff. We're seeing some changes over time as we evolve this thing. It's kind of experimentally a little weird because we are changing a lot of things each semester, but we're trying to measure this and actually get down to the point where we can say, yeah, we really see noticeable difference in things like understanding, retention, recall, those kind of things. So there's definitely opportunity for that. So here's now where we get into you guys' part. about perfect here. There's three basic components to the way I've applied this. And like I told you, this is a idiosyncratic solution to a very specific problem. I know that in my class. But there's, they earn currency for what you want them to do. They can invest it for various concepts you're trying to teach. And we have all sorts of stuff, secondary ticket markets, where they actually invest their, their currency. And then they get to spend it on stuff they want. You can incorporate experiences everywhere along this path potentially. I'm going to give you three examples here in a second. And you don't even have to have this whole thing set up to do a little piece of it. So here would be an example from maybe another college around or another department around a building. Let's say I'm in a lab. They're doing something technical. And I know when they get out in the real world, there is going to be some expectation of efficiency in the lab. You're going to have to do something a certain number of times a day. So you could incentivize not just the fact that they can get the exact result or the reaction that you want, say in Kim Lab, but they do it with some level of efficiency. And what you want them to experience is, okay, I've been in this lab for two months, and I think I've got a pretty good handle on this, but wow, that feels way different when you tell me I have to think, have that thing done by 920. And that's something they might face in the workplace. You want them to experience it. You want to think about it. You don't want them to be surprised by it. Say I have a finance class. I'm talking about I've got a derivatives class. And I'm talking about options. And I, I know we can estimate, and we'll get out our black shoals formula, and we'll get an estimate for the option, for the uh, Pricing of the option, we'll watch it change as we get towards expiration, the stock price moves around. But if you have some sort of incentive system where they actually have something they value that they can essentially invest, it's a simulation, but they value the currency, the points, whatever it is, then when that thing's moving up and down, it's not just an academic exercise. Oh man, they're checking their stock price, their option prices on their phone all the time. They're totally invested. Wow, I wonder what happened. Why the stock price go up? It's just a whole different level of experience here. Then all you guys can do this, for sure. If you have some way, they get points, whatever you want to do, points for things you want them to do in the class, you're going to have opportunities to come up. You might have a guest speaker in your class or just in your college, and you might be invited to a little luncheon or a little coffee or something, 
and you just say, I do this all the time. We had a lunch up here the other day, and I said, hey, do you mind if I bring a couple students? And for the students, it's an incredible opportunity, but one thing I've really noticed is any time you can get a student to sit down with you and a couple external people that are professionals in the area they want to be in, just no matter what happens in the meeting, for them to just sit there and have a conversation and be part of a conversation between an academic in the area, some professionals in the area, and you're bringing them in as just a colleague, it's just a game changer for them. And when they get on their job in the first day, their boss says, hey, you, me, and this person, we're going for coffee or lunch. It's not the first time you've experienced it. So we can all do that, right? That's the opportunities come up for sure. Okay, here's what I wanna do. Our goal is creativity. We can do this for about 15 minutes and then talk about it for a second. Get out a piece of paper and in your class, jot down two or three things that you really wish your students could experience that would really make a difference for them if they experienced that and felt what that was like. That's kind of the first part. And I think that's sort of a good exercise for all of us going into a semester. If I just got a few things that I really want them to know, that I really want them to have felt, what are those things? What are those key things? And then just sort of start working on the list. Do you already have something built into your course that you could use as your currency? Some of you probably do. I keep mine completely separate from the grading because I'm sort of an analytics guy and we introduce randomness into the system all the time and I don't want their grades to have any randomness to them. Some of your things you wanna do are not gonna have a randomness component. It's gonna have a learning component. So you could actually use course points, participation points or something. It's all context-based. I keep it totally separate because I wanna use it as a playground, a sandbox to do whatever I want that's totally separate from their, their official grade of the course. And then the next thing is, what do you have in your inventory that they want? And I guarantee you the answer is way more than you currently know. I think of stuff every day, and even more so my students think of stuff every day. I get emails all the time or people catch me before or after class thinking of new ideas of things that they value that would help the learning and make class more fun and incentivize them and engage them. So the way I'm thinking about this is, Talk about this stuff. If you see somebody in the same department as you, go over and walk over and talk to them. Think of a few bullet points there, just a few experiences, and then think about ways that you could use something from what we talked about today to incentivize that in some way to engage, to engage them. And I'm glad to chat with you, and we'll kind of see. This is a little bit, I'm back on the tightrope, you never know, but I think we might be able to, to come up with a few ideas and then we'll get to about five till and, and wrap that up a little bit and see what you came up with. But go for it. Expect you to talk, move around, whatever you need to do. Chat with me, however we can come up with some ideas. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, you guys, let's see where we're at. Does somebody just have a great idea, just a revelation you want to share with us here? Okay, a pretty good idea. It might be a possibility. Okay, what do you got? it in some way that your most dedicated, excited student can get that opportunity, it takes, care, it takes care of me from two perspectives. It doesn't feel arbitrary to the students. They're essentially deciding it. And number one is I don't have to think and evaluate as hard who would be the best student in terms of motivation and the person I want to get in front of somebody I'm trying to build a relationship with, the doctor in this particular case. So it, it works really nice in that way. I, I think that's great. Anybody got anything else? I know what just happened. You guys' ideas are so good. You don't want to let the cat out of the bag. You're going to go make it happen. Hey, I am, I am always an email away. I would love to hear feedback, ideas, I, I would really love, it would help me immensely if you could tell me how you took at least a portion of this and applied this to the class. In fact, somebody bring me a compelling second example of how this works and we're writing a paper together and submitting it somewhere, right? Then we're starting to talk about some generalizability. So just, just kind of let me know there. I don't know why. Um, I hope we've spurred your creativity today, if nothing else. I already heard some cool ideas about industrial engineering. My daughter just graduated. It melds exactly with the conversations I've been having with her. This whole idea of optimizing a system, dollars and cents, but what about the people working in the system? Is the job sustainable? Is it doable? Is it pleasant at any level? Turnover, recruitment, there's just a million human factors tied in, right? Okay, I don't know why. I sort of felt motivated to show you this. 
on would be good. There we go. I love stuff like this. We just talked about right before. There's so many interesting, talented people on this class in this campus. I just met Don just really recently, but I'd, I'd, heard, I'd heard the name as just a really good professor on this campus doing some innovative things. It's fun just meeting different people and getting the chance to talk and figure that out. And sometimes it's just happenstance and little things. I've never even met, met Mick Charney. I was in a room with him at mortar board was giving awards for teaching excellence. And he was one of the recipients and he made a little comment at the end and said, he teaches a large lecture class. And this poem is his little acronym for what he thinks works. And it really resonated with me. I jotted it down on the back of my program and I sort of stumbled onto a couple of them. What we talked about today really hit the passion and the memorable moments. So I got this on my board now. And when I think about things we're doing in class, Here's somebody that spent some time and some study from a scholarly perspective on how do you make a big class work? And I don't have to reinvent the wheel on everything. How can I leverage what somebody, just a talented person on campus has already done? It's been a nice little thing for me. So coming to stuff like this is just always good. I always learn a little something. And I think my favorite part is, I always thought of college campuses kind of more like when you're a student and you're all over the place all the time and you're having all these experiences, when the reality is if you're not careful, you just work in an office building. You park right out front, you walk in before anybody's here, you usually leave when everybody's gone. And it's just kind of like, go, this stuff's different. You meet people from departments all over campus. It's really great. So guys, I've enjoyed the hour. I hope there's a tidbit, something you can take away, but uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks for coming.